uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Sharma, let me thank you first. And they are doing a great service for the veterinary profession. Uh, not only by way of uh, a lot of uh, pharmaceutical drugs which you have brought in, but a special reference to uh, herbal drugs, which is the uh, need of the R. Because as an, uh, we go about uh, treating our pets, we come across lots of drug resistance, uh, lots of you know uh, problems associated with drugs, all those things, which can be solved only by alternative medicine. In this regard, whatever you are doing is great job. And Dr. Sudhir, uh, being a secretary, you have done a great job inviting all these people for their CE program. Uh, looking forward to doing more with you guys. And thanks a lot for uh, giving me this opportunity. I always uh, think this opportunity given to me is uh, really wonderful because I like to meet people. I like to uh, share with them what little I know. And therefore, thanks a lot for you people. Straight away, we'll go with the subject. Uh, now uh, we are going to talk about pulmonary diseases. Uh, so uh, Dr. Sharma was saying it consists of four parts. And you know, so I will uh, restrict myself to the disease part of it. And the radiological part, uh, I was told uh, other professor is going to take care. So let me talk about the uh, common respiratory problems which we come across in day-to-day -day practice. I'm not going to deal with whatever is there in the book. As much as possible, I do not want to be very um, uh, academic. I want to be more practical. So I made as much as possible a very simple slide so that is not confusing to us. So first of all, uh, what I want to tell all the veterinary uh, uh, you know, practitioners is that we have to remove the mental block which we have saying that these things are not possible in veterinary profession. These things are not possible in the uh, place where I have. These are the limited uh, things we have. Such a mental block we should always remove and uh, look forward to uh, reaching great heights. As such, we have uh, lots and lots of private practitioners doing great jobs, like in uh, you know, Delhi and Mumbai and uh, Bangalore. See, I know uh, one guy is doing uh, stents for uh, tracheal collapse in uh, Bangalore. I know uh, people are doing uh, stents for uh, tracheal collapse in Chennai. And therefore, much more uh, people are doing such works in uh, Delhi and other places. And we have to catch up with them to stay in the race. So with this few words, I will start. So respiratory diseases, most often we come across in our practice as an emergency basis. Because you know that, you know, uh, so on your right hand side, if you see, you have a small uh, picture which depicts a capillary and uh, cells and intercellular space. For the cell to be happy and perform its function, it requires two things. One is the oxygen, another is glucose. So you know very well that oxygen is there in the atmosphere and it has to reach the cells. How does it reach? Because of an effective circulatory, I mean, respiratory system. And having reached the alveoli, this oxygen has to get dissociated into the RBCs. And from there on, it has to be taken to various places by an effective cardiovascular system. So a cardiovascular system and respiratory system a share common interest in the welfare of the uh, well-being of the cells. So you know very well that uh, for an effective respiratory system, you require uh, excellent nares, pharynx, larynx. Okay, so now you see the right-hand side corner, you have a cellular respiration summon, uh, summary. In the absence of uh, you know um, oxygen, what happens, there is no ATP at all generated. If ATP is not generated, uh, your cells cannot function, cells die, and the organ comprising of cells also will die. So you'll inv invariably they'll go into a most multiple organ dysfunction. So this is simply the critical uh, function of the respiratory system. So you have upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract, and you have a pleural space. So any problem anywhere, can result in faulty or no oxygen reaching the alveoli. So upper respiratory tract uh, consists of nares, pharynx, larynx, trachea. We have a cervical part of trachea and thoracic part of trachea, then bifurcation, bronchioles, alveoli. That's lung parenchyma. And outside the lung, you have a pleural space. That also contributes to the well-being of the expansion of lungs. 
So if you look at the uh, respiratory uh, tract diseases, you have both uh, inflammatory and non-inflammatory, infectious and non-infectious. And most of the uh, uh, things we get by signalment. Young animals are prone for infectious disease. You know very well uh, infectious peritonitis in uh, cat uh, and um, uh, distemper, herpes, um, or mycoplasma. All these things affect young animals. And genetics is another very important thing which we'll have to take into consideration while we are seeing respiratory tract diseases. Chronic pulmonary fibrosis seen in West Highland Terriers. Probably we don't see this breed much. Feline asthma you see very commonly in Siamese cats. And uh, upper respiratory tract disease is very, very commonly seen in brachycephalic breeds. Brachycephalic breeds are the one like pugs, bulldogs, all these things represent brachycephalic breed. We'll talk more about this URT disease in brachycephalic breeds. And dolichocephalic breed where the long nosed dogs, we get aspergillosis like, uh, you know, hounds. Uh, you know, we get uh, incidence of uh, aspergillosis and tumors very commonly uh, seen. Next is history is very, very important. So travel history, again, um, tells you a lot about uh, which place the pet has been to, whether there is any infectious uh, problem there. All these things you will come across in your travel history. Then uh, environment, allergy, you know, uh, smoke, plants, all these things uh, will give you. Yeah. So uh, most of the times uh, these uh, dog or cats, they tell you what problem they have. So only it's uh, important that we observe the animal properly and then find out uh, uh, what problem uh, the pet has. Next is a palpation. You can palpate uh, the nasal cavity, you can palpate the pharynx, larynx, and the trachea. Uh, you know, you can palpate and find out what pathology they have. Next is percussion. Percussion is very useful to find out diaphragmatic hernia and things like that. Of course, auscultation is very, very important because the whole uh, thoracic area you can auscultate. So uh, palpation and of course um, auscultation is a very integral part of uh, uh, the physical examination. The art of uh, auscultation we allow to train over years. So unless we use a stethoscope regularly and you know we cannot pick up uh, you know fine uh, sounds produced by the vesicles or the uh, alveoli, we will not be able to immediately do it. But nevertheless, it gives you a lot and lot of diagnosis. Whether it is the, the sounds are emanating from the cardo dorsal area or the ventral uh, lung lobe or the middle lobe. So, basically, with that, you can diagnose very many diseases. Next, please. So, next is observing the posture. Posture is very, very important. See, the an animal with severe, uh, you know, respiratory problem, they have a different posture. Especially for dogs, they have an abducted elbows, flat nares extended neck, all these problems uh, says that the dog is having very limited space for breathing and therefore they, we know that they have uh, real dyspnea. And similarly cat, they have their uh, all the limbs tucked under the abdomen and the abdomen is kind of, you know, sort of raised up. So you know that it requires more space, so it, is, it does that. Once you know that uh, position you see in the cat, that means it's very badly affected mm -hmm. with the respiratory problem. Then the breathing pattern. Breathing pattern is very important. So what you should do is look at the abdomen and the chest together. So if they go together in a normal amplitude, it is a normal breathing pattern. If they go in opposite direction, it is called paradoxical movement and it is diagnostic of pleural effusion. If they have a very shallow, small amplitude uh, up and down movement, that means they've got pneumonia. So the breathing pattern will tell you what disease the uh, pet has got. Then the behavior. An animal which uh, does not, uh, you know, show any interest in the environment and shows more interest in the respiration, you know it has got a respiratory problem. If it shows a lot of interest in the environment and it is not uh, concentrating on the respiration, that means it is nothing to do with the respiratory system. You will have to look in for uh, probably uh, an, uh, other system where it can have a, a success, a clinical uh, uh, symptoms. Then sounds. Sounds are most important diagnostic uh, signs in a respiratory disease. Whenever you hear sounds or respiratory noises, that means rest assured you are having an upper respiratory tract problem. 
there is no need to doubt about a small uh, lower respiratory problem at all whatever you are able to uh, hear only with a stethoscope it is a lower respiratory problem so we will try and see what are the sounds produced sometimes i have i have watched some videos i don't know if you will be able to see the videos otherwise also i will try and mimic some uh, uh, you know sounds which uh, and i'll tell you what uh, problem the pet has got next please so this is a cat which has a very res severe respiratory problem you can see the both the uh, legs tucked under the abdomen and the both the hind limbs also tucked under the abdomen and raised dorsal lumbar uh, cervical uh, region is raised so this is this means this cat doesn't have a good reserve of um, you know uh, space for respiration next please This is a dog which has a, a sort of a respiratory problem, but definitely it is very friendly with the environment. If it uh, shows, you will see this pet showing a lot of interest in the environment. That means it has got no issues with the respiratory system at all. The problem is elsewhere. So you know that uh, you need not waste your time trying to find out what respiratory problem. Though it looks like a respiratory problem, it is not a respiratory problem. Most probably this dog has got a neurological problem. and we will have to see what it is next please okay there will be a small fine movement on the uh, thoracic inlet it is going in, uh, in, in and out that is called cupula cupular movement that is highly significant of a very stressful respiratory disease in a cat so this is a, a expiratory strider in a boxer so you will see the you will uh, when you see the video you will see the sounds emanating during expiration so this is a expiratory strider i already told you whenever you are hearing a sound without the help of stethoscope it is a upper respiratory tract problem but nevertheless it is a expiratory strider is a thoracic part of the trachea so it has got a problem in the thoracic part of the trachea and therefore it has got a severe expiratory strider <laughs> Next, please. So this is a shallow, rapid breathing with an open mouth breathing in a small spits. It is highly suggestive of pneumonia when the movement of chest and abdomen is very shallow and rapid, and an open mouth breathing. It is highly suggestive of a lower respiratory tract problem, and only with the help of a stethoscope. you will be able to hear the lung sounds and therefore this is highly suggestive of pneumonia
ப்ளாட் ஆகிடும் நடுவோம் ஃபைப்ரி அதெல்லாம் வந்து அப்செட் ஆகிற மாதிரி நேரம் இருந்துச்சு again this is a beautiful uh, picture of uh, pleural effusion uh, see the, the both the chest and the abdomen will move in opposite direction so once you switch, uh, see this you will have to do a thoracocentesis see at least dogs can live uh, for another few days more with a pleural effusion but if a cat comes to the pleural effusion if you do not do the thoracocentesis it can die the same day so once you see the abdomen and chest move in the opposite direction it is very clear that it has got a pleural effusion and it's very important that you put a needle in the seventh intercostal space and remove the fluid upper two third if it is air and lower two third if it is fluid so uh, you can remove the uh, uh, fluid from the thoracic cavity and that is highly diagnostic of pleural effusion next please so next is palpation palpation is a uh, important uh, you know physical method of ex examination you can uh, palpate the pharynx from above for uh, evidence of pain or mass you can see larynx again same way you can palpate and find out uh, for the evidence of uh, you know any pain or mass in the larynx trachea you can uh, palpate to find out if there is any laxity in case of tracheal collapse or it also facilitates in an animal having a cough, elicit a cough. So sometimes uh, even with the upper respiratory tract disease, the pet which comes to the clinic uh, will not uh, show clinical signs. In such of those times, when you slightly uh, you know, stimulate the trachea, they go in for a, a severe cough which you can recognize as a tracheal collapse or a laryngeal collapse or whatever it is. So that uh, way it helps when you are palpating the trachea. Nasal turbinates. Nasal turbinates when you, uh, you know, palpate, if it evinces pain, it is highly uh, suggestive of the infiltrated disease of the nasal turbinates, such as aspergillosis. Next, please. Lung auscultation. Lung auscultation starts from the zipphoid cartilage, the curved line up to the 10th uh, vertebra. And on the... Um, um, the dorsal side uh, on the cranial side you have the shoulders scapula so you will have to have a triangular mark on your right hand side corner you have a dorsal caudal uh, lobe and then the left cranial lo lobe is there and you have a ventral cranial lobe all these things you have to auscultate while you are auscultating first better to auscultate the caudal dorsal aspect that is the furthermost part top aspect you auscultate first where you will be able to hear lung sound normal lung sounds and gradually you come down methodically and you will be able to find uh, where you have exaggerated sounds where you have crackles where you have wheezes all those things you will be able to enjoy during a um, auscultation of the lungs next please normal lung sounds major airways or uh, uh, dorsal caudal on the aspect of uh, mostly and uh, always compare these both sides listen from top to bottom evaluate the uh, several respiratory cycles sometimes you may miss one or two cycles therefore several cycles of respiratory cycles you will have to listen to and uh, as i told you the lung uh, field uh, extends from zipphoid process to the p10 uh, rostrally to point of shoulder and ventral to the sternum it extends and uh, Animals in respiratory distress can have exaggerated excursions. If abnormalities of lung sounds present, note pace of respiratory cycle when they are best heard, whether it's during inspiration or whether during expiration. That should be uh, uh, heard properly. Next, please. So listen to the uh, dorsal caudal lung field, as I told you, dorsal caudal lung field first, and identify normal sounds. Some part side to side. Listen over the trachea and larynx if animal is coughing or on dyspnea. Record abnormal. So you'll have to first do dorsal caudal, then come down to the central part, then come to the ventral uh, cranial part, and then you'll have to uh, auscultate the larynx and you'll have to auscultate the trachea also. Next, please. So normal breath sounds are bronchiovesicular, okay? And the normal but increased in the, uh, intensity you get. Uh, in case of uh, pulmonary parenchymal disease 
abnormal as i told you you have to know whether it is aspiration pneumonia is aspiration pneumonia ventral cranial border you will get the uh, when, uh, sounds and if it is in the whole of thorax is pulmonary parenchyma if it is only in the middle lobe it is got a cardiac pulmonary edema so with that you will be able to find out where exactly is the pathology next please So, uh, discontinuous sounds heard best during inspiration. That is fine, close crackles. So, during uh, inspiration, you find uh, crackles and uh, close uh, sounds. That means it's got a bronchial problem, bronchioalveolar problem. Continuous sounds usually heard on expiration is because of airway narrowing, uh, obstruction in the passage. That is, uh, you get continuous sounds. Frictional rub you get during Uh, you know, uh, plural uh, 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 rubbing. So, uh, in case of pleurisy, you get the plural uh, rub. Next, please. So, in this table, you find uh, the various, uh, you know, um, uh, locations and uh, types of inspiration, auscultation uh, results, differential diagnosis, and emergency treatment. So, as I told you, um, extra thoracic upper airways. You get inspiratory dyspnea. Then intrathoracic, you get uh, inspiratory dyspnea, but you will be able to uh, see the cough uh, with a stethoscope only. Okay, like that, you, you have got uh, different uh, areas where you will be able to get different sounds. Next, please. So clinical signs, cough. Cough is the uh, most important clinical signs of a respiratory uh, disease. And uh, coughing, you should know whether it has got a uh, productive cough or uh, unproductive cough. Um, and uh, if it is uh, productive, uh, what type of uh, whether it is able to swallow or not, all those things uh, you'll be able to find out from uh, the cough. And again, we will uh, see more about cough uh, in the subsequent uh, uh, slides. Sneezing and reverse sneezing. Sneezing is a outward. A thrust of air, you know how we sneeze. Same way, sneezing is a, a small irritant in the nasal passage. You sneeze. Say, so usually you get a sound like that. And reverse sneezing is a, you know, a very threatening sound which a, a pet makes, where the reverse uh, flow of air into possible uh, entry of air into the nasal cavity, it almost looks like snoring. Okay, that's called reverse sneezing. Okay, it will be like this. This is called reverse sneezing. This is highly suggestive of a problem in the soft pilot or a hot pilot. Either the foreign body is there, or uh, you know, uh, uh, nasal mites are there, or uh, uh, infection is there in the uh, pharynx or uh, soft pilot or hot pilot. So reverse sneezing uh, is a very important uh, thing which you should uh, be able to appreciate in a pet. Nasal discharge. Nasal discharge can be unilateral or bilateral. So you should know whether it is mucus or mucopurulent or hemorrhagic. Usually, if it is bilateral, it is a problem rostral to the uh, you know uh, nasal cavities. It is uh, near the pharynx or the hard palate or soft palate. If it is uh, um, uh, unilateral, then it is a problem of the nasal cavity. So probably aspergillosis. If it is a unilateral mucopurulent discharge, it is probably uh, aspergillosis. So you'll be able to see it as a bilateral or unilateral. Respiratory noises, which we already seen, loud noises, you no know, stutter and stutter, these are all of upper respiratory tract problems. Then pain on palpation. So whenever you palpate the, uh, we already saw how you palpate the muscle cavity, how you palpate the pharynx and larynx. If you have pain and the uh, pet is resenting it, then you have the problem in that uh, area. Next, please. So what we'll do is after the finishing, we'll again try to re-enter and see the videos at least. Okay, it's very important that we see that. Uh... Okay, next is distortion and asymmetry of nasal cavity. So you look at the uh, animal from the front, you find any changes from the left side to right side in the symmetry of the nasal cavity. Then you'll be able to know any proliferating disease of the nasal turbinates, which is highly diagnosed uh, diagnostic of uh, aspergillosis. Then examination of the oral cavity, again, is very, very important. When you have a problem like a root uh, tooth abscess, that has a oral nasal uh, uh, you know, connectivity and you get discharge. 
So you should be able to see whether he's got any um, uh, abscess in the tooth or has got any other problem. Uh, also, when you are examining the oral cavity, you can depress the tongue and uh, look at the pharynx or larynx, and you can look at the vocal folds. All those things you'll be able to see. You can see polyps, which are very, very common in cats. You can, uh, by doing an oral cavity examination, you'll be able to get a good diagnosis of upper respiratory uh, tract problem. Epistaxis, again, a very, very common problem in veterinary practice. Epistaxis, again, is whether it's unilateral or uh, you know, uh, bilateral. Usually, uh, uh, copious amount of epistaxis is not due to a uh, nasal problem. It is due to a, a different problem, either like thrombocytopenia, or it is due to uh, hypertension, or any of those conditions where you can find severe epistaxis. Uh, uh, scanty epistaxis is due, due to usually due to aspergillosis or due to some tumors in the nasal cavity. So whenever you see epistaxis, you will have to find out whether it's unilateral or uh, bilateral, whether it is copious or scanty. Then you should be able to find out the history that has got any injury to see the, the reason for epistaxis. And uh, you can examine the nasal cavity with a rigid scope and find out if it has got uh, nasal aspergillosis or it's got a polyp or has got a tumor, all those things you'll be able to uh, examine with the help of a rigid scope. Next, please. Cough, as I already told you about uh, cough, um, we'll see uh, more. There's, there are severe, several reasons for cough, animal to cough, and a few of them are inflammatory. It can be neoplastic in the pulmonary system. It can be cardiovascular uh, because of the edema. It can be allergic, which is very commonly you see, parasitic, visceral larva, migrant, a protozoal problem can uh, induce cough, fungal problem. All these things you will be able to show. Once you get a cough, first you should rule out whether it is a, a cardiac problem or a non-cardiac problem. If it is a cardiac problem, you'll have to find out if the left side of congestive heart failure or right side congestive heart failure. If it is a right side congestive heart failure, you'll have to find out whether it's got a wet lung. If it is a left side failure, the left atrium is enlarged, is compressing the uh, trachea, then you know what is the reason for the cough. Okay, this is, these are the things which you'll have to think about cough. And you'll have to differentiate cough from sneezing and reverse sneezing and retching, which most times, most of the times, the clients will come and tell you, uh, confuse you with uh, cough. Uh, in uh, actuality, the animal will be retching. So you'll have to make those sounds and show uh, how the pet is doing. Or you should have a video recording. <coughs> Sometimes uh, vomiting and uh, gagging, all these things will be uh, reported by the client as cough. So you'll have to be very, very careful, uh, you know, in uh, trying to find out uh, what it is. And as I already told you, it is a productive cough. Productive cough means it is bringing about some sputum. Either it is bringing it out, or swallowing immediately after a cough, if the pet makes efforts to swallow, then it is a productive cough. It is highly suggestive of chronic bronchitis, pneumonia, or pulmonary edema. Non-productive cough is usually seen in cardiac disease, left atrial enlargement, lymphadenopathies, allergic uh, conditions, and uh, tracheal irritation or tracheal collapse. As I told you, all these things are non-productive cough you'll see. So, and the cough, when it occurs, cough, whether it is uh, happening while the animal is drinking, it is highly suggestive of laryngeal uh, disease. If the cough is at night, at least to start with, that means it is a cardiac problem. If a cough is while, uh, you know, um, uh, pulling the collar, when the um, animal is taken for a walk and the client pulls the collar and the animal is uh, coughing, then it is highly suggest suggestive of tracheal collapse. So you should be very, very careful when you evaluate cough. As I told you, whenever cough comes, you'll have to see if it is cardiac or non-cardiac. Next, you'll have to see if it is lung or whether it is non-lung. So these four classifications you have to make and you'll have to have the differentials for all those things. Based on clinical science, you'll be able to zero in on what type of, whether it's a cardiac or non-cardiac, whether it is uh, associated with uh, lungs or not associated with lungs, you'll be able to clearly diagnose. Next, please.
nasal discharge as i already told you is unilateral or uh, bilateral is mucoid serous or hemorrhagic and you know sometimes you find ulcerated nasal planum that means it has been having a chronic uh, uh, nasal disease because of uh, ulcerated nasal planum highly suggestive aspergillosis mycoplasma in cats so again you see a uh, mucoid uh, hemorrhagic uh, nasal discharge and bacterial infection you also see uh, severe uh, uh, nasal discharge next please again we'll come to epistaxis what are the differentials of epistaxis if it is uh, scanty and if it is unilateral mostly is aspergillosis or foreign body or tumor or trauma and whenever you have epistaxis the differentials are thrombocytopenia or systemic hypertension both of which we'll have to rule out next please respiratory noises so i told you strider and stetter what is strider is a continuous noise stetter it is a non continuous sound both heard at the distance you know even from two rooms away you will be able to uh, hear a strider or a stetter so that means it's a upper respiratory tract problem if it is occurring during inspiratory inspiration it is extra thoracic <coughs> that is upper respiratory tract it is doing expiratory it means it is a, a thoracic part of the uh, trachea so it's very clearly the noises can be uh, if you are really confused yes about uh, where it emanates whatever the noise the pet makes you please keep your uh, hand on the throat and make us mimic the same noise wherever it vibrates that is a place where the uh, dog has got the problem if it is vibrating in the larynx it is a laryngeal problem it is vibrating in the uh, trachea it is a tracheal problem so whatever the pet uh, sound it makes try to mimic it by yourself by holding the your hands on the throat then you will know where exactly the sound is coming from next please so now we we'll see upper respiratory tract diseases so i want to tell you what i'm going to talk to you about now which are all commonly see okay first is a nasal disease so you have nasal aspergillosis you have definitely seen this but i don't know how many of you are treating them properly i will tell you anyway how to treat them but uh, you should understand what it is when the dog is coming to you you should know that this is a problem and what you should know and uh, next is a laryngeal problem it can be a laryngeal problem as a part of your you know um, ball that is a brachycephalic uh, airway syndrome or it can be a simple uh, laryngeal problem or it can be a combination and that tracheal disease whether is a tracheal collapse or a tracheal hypoplasia in certain dogs you get tracheal hypoplasia so tracheal disease mostly tracheal collapse which you see in small breeds all like you know spits uh, you know uh, lasapso terio all those uh, breeds which are less than 10 kilo find tracheal disorder next slide please <coughs> so you need to know the respiratory anatomy to find out uh, you know the nasal meatus then how the nasal meatus goes into and where is the tongue where is the soft palate where is the hard palate to what extent the uh, soft palate extends to, to the level of the glottis it reaches all these things you will be able to appreciate once you see this cross section okay then only you will be able to understand the pathophysiology of the subsequent problems next please so what are the diseases we are going to see we are going to see nasal aspergillosis then we are going to see brachycephalic airway syndrome which consists of uh, stenotic nares then you have a uh, soft palate elongated soft palate uh, laryngeal uh, uh, protrusion and uh, uh, larynx uh, protrusion all these things uh, put together is called brachycephalic airway syndrome then laryngeal collapse laryngeal paralysis uh, laryngeal paralysis is called recurrent uh, laryngeal nerve paralysis uh, which is seen in large breeds of dogs like dobermann uh, I mean, uh, uh, labradors and tracheal collapse as i already told you uh, we have seen in uh, small breeds of dogs of course uh, lesser importance are uh, tracheal stenosis nasopharyngeal polyps intraluminal foreign bodies primary tra uh, tracheal neoplasias 
extra uh, luminal problems compressing the trachea like you know left atrial enlargement all those things are all uh, smaller problems associated with upper respiratory tract problem next please so in nasal aspergillosis this is by uh, fungus called aspergillus fumigatus it affects dolichocephalic breeds all those breeds which have got long noses they are do dolichocephalic breeds and those are the dogs which are mainly affected young to middle aged uh, dogs they are usually the pathophysiology is a destruction of turbinate bones frontal bones and the mucosa these are the main uh, pathophysiology of nasal aspergillosis very painful disease next please so the clinical signs are purulent mucopurulent discharge depigmentation ulceration of the nas because it's very chronic you find them depigmented and ulcerated and you most often uh, you know the client com complains of sneezing unilateral epistaxis open mouth breathing because there is obstruction next please so the differential diagnosis nasal neoplasia lymphoplasmocytic rhinitis foreign bodies two throat abscess so i said when you have open the mouth you have to see for the two throat abscess and foreign bodies you can still examine during with the rigid scopes uh, lymphoplasmocytic rhinitis if uh, other uh, things are ruled out you can think about lymphoplasmocytic rhinitis where it is uh, amenable for steroids nasal neoplasia again by rigid scope we will be able to diagnose nasal neoplasia next please so diagnosis may be based mainly on clinical signs where you have pain on palpation of the nasal turbinates where you have mucopurulent discharge unilateral mostly sometimes hemorrhagic so you have a clinical signs very characteristic of this problem then serology if it is possible you can do imaging studies x ray ct and mri if it is available in your practice you can do x rays are uh, highly uh, diagnostic because there is a lot of light changes in the turbinates then rhinoscopy the rigid scope if you have got uh, facilities you can see the uh, cotton ball appearance of this uh, fungus then endoscopy is a gold standard so the animal is put on uh, dorsal recumbency you uh, intubate the animal and uh, anesthetize an animal and you will have to pass on the uh, uh, endoscope and j maneuver bend it and come in the naso oral pharynx from inside you have come to the oral cavity from the, just behind the uh, hot palate you have a small opening towards the nasal turbinates through that you have to bend those uh, endoscope and come into it you will see this beautiful cotton fluffy uh, you know uh, mass that is called j maneuver of course you can collect of our cytology and histology and fungal culture next please so you have imaging studies you have radiography which will tell you that it is got the lighting changes in the turbinates and of course ct will be more diagnostic if you have facilities for ct ct is highly diagnostic next please so this is a radiology of uh, uh, you know dog suffering from uh, um, aspergillosis you can find finely uh, destructed nasal turbinates medial meatus is completely destroyed next please so this is the rigid scope Uh, with which you can see this cotton candy appearance, which is uh, highly uh, suggestive of aspergillosis. Next, please. So you can see a cytology where you find find these spores and hyphae, which is uh, pathognomonic for uh, nasal aspergillosis. Next, please. Next, please. So you can go in for uh, antifungal uh, topical. Uh, mostly, is very difficult because. they sneeze and you know they don't uh, accept these uh, topical antifungal preparations so easily so you have to go for systemic antifungals again is very difficult because systemic antifungal to reach these uh, turbinates where it is not having much blood supply you don't get such a very good uh, you know uh, uh, treatment uh, uh, success for the systemic antifungals nevertheless you have a systemic antifungal treatment protocol for this where you have use ampetrosin itraconazole and things like that and most of the i don't know whether anybody is doing in india i have not seen anybody doing in india it is done abroad so again this is a mental makeup with our vets we don't do this invasive surgical procedures one is called a soak method 
Anand is called trephining. You trephine the skull, make a hole in the skull, and you put a tube and uh, uh, you know uh, put antifungals in that. Both the methods I will um, uh, tell you now. You can see. Next, please. <coughs> Don't worry about this. Uh, this is uh, amphotericin uh, um, oral um, drug, uh, which you give for three days. Uh, they got two uh, types. One is a lipid, and is an ordinary one. Lipids you give uh, two to three milligram, and the other one you give zero point two five milligram. This is given intravenously. You mix it with uh, distilled water, and you have to give it uh, uh, three days in a week. And uh, fluconazole, etraconazole, you can give orally, and tryptophan you can give orally. So these are all antifungal, both intravenous, amphotericin, and uh, oral fluconazole, etraconazole, and uh, tryptophan. Next, please. So this is what is called a soak procedure. You can see the animal on a dorsal recumbency. You can see it is intubated and uh, anesthetized. So you can uh, see the J maneuver. Okay, uh, uh, you can see for diagnosis. This is the mask as well as the orodental opening behind the soft palate. So that uh, the intracranial uh, stays in the nasal turbinates, nasal meatus. All the three meatus are there. The medial and uh, os meatus are there. It will be completely filled with metazol. This is done once a week. So it is uh, done under anesthesia. So this is called soap method. This next one. Next, please. Uh, this is called refining, where. Uh, you plug the uh, external nash with the um, uh, police catheter and you do trephining. You drill uh, two or the four holes in the uh, you know, skull and uh, you have to fix the uh, um, tube there and fill it with fill the uh, nasal turbinates with intercanazole. This you do uh, once daily. This should be done in an IP. So where uh, the, these animals will be with the head uh, defined with those, uh, you know, um, uh, tubes uh, protruding their uh, foreheads. And uh, every day uh, morning, you can, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, close the external nash with the polys and fill in this uh, nasal cavity with the intercanosol. This is called trephining method. Both methods are easy. 